got in here this morning. Mostly, no, they're not good looking, are they, Jerry? What do you think? In the eyes of the Lord, they're wonderfully made, <laughs> majestic, beautiful, handsome, but that's the Lord. We haven't got there yet. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. I tell you what, before we get into anything, uh, let me do a quick survey. As I, wow, I pulled the Dougie. Welcome, Doug. Wait a minute, wait a minute. But I didn't turn my volume off before I started, so I have all the, my phone, my phone will actually work. Yours doesn't. Yeah. You could have done that back there. You know that? Well, but it feels better to do it up here. No, you just need attention. If you are watching this or joining us here live in person, please like and share this on the Facebook page. And gentlemen, we also got a YouTube channel. I'm going to remind everybody it's been a while. So those of you that have friends that you want to watch this and they refuse to get on Bookface, ODC Men is our YouTube channel, and this is actually live right now on YouTube as well. It's only on once a week, but it's there, and they can go back and watch it over and over and over again. So always, we ask you, uh, those of you who have Facebook or those of you that do the YouTube thing, to take this and share this. And the whole reason why we ask you to share it is is because hopefully on your thread, your friends, your, the ones that you influence and even the ones that stalk your page because they can't stand you, might run across this and it might intrigue them to hear some uh, sound uh, teaching. Before we go any further, and I know you think you have something wise to say, but you can wait a second. Yes, sir. <laughs> Let's do a quick survey because we were having a discussion a minute ago. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me retract for a second. My son, who is stationed in uh, Fairbanks at Fort Wayne, uh, Wayne, Wayne Wright, yes, Fort Wayne Wright in Alaska, uh, is coming back for the holidays on the 23rd. I'm excited. So he told me the other day, he said, I already have my list of restaurants I want to go to, Dad. He said, he's going to be here like two weeks, and he's got like 15 different restaurants he wants to eat while he's here because they don't have them in Alaska. And like number two, number one was Cane's. Number two was Whataburger. Right. Amen. So I use that to prelude into this. Those those men that do come in person to the Bible study on Tuesday mornings get treated to a water burger taquito. All because Doug gets up a little bit early and go wait in line 30 minutes to get us breakfast. So I now, appreciate that. What's really cool is I call, I say, well, good morning, water burger. And they go, hi, Doug. Would you like your 20 taquitos? And I'll, I mean, they know me by name. It's cool. There you go. Yeah. I pay you to be a little bit more proactively and smart. So thank you. <laughs> uh, so what I want to ask is, so we can get a better idea, how many men prefer the bacon? If you'd rather have bacon, raise your hand. So Doug can get a count. He was asking a while ago. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, okay. Yeah, and, there, there were a couple of sausage left back there. Yeah, how so. many? How many prefer sausage? Did anybody like those breakfast on a bun six. things that I that I got for a while? Pardon? A Bob Ranchero. Ooh, that's a sauce. So and it's breakfast on a bun. So you're like 60 40. Yeah. You're like 60 40 yeah. on the bacon and sausage. So, all right, I'll tell you what, guys. Uh, I'm going to talk. Let's pull another table out and chairs. Okay. Please, sir. So, anyway. Uh, those of you that do get up and come on a Tuesday morning, we actually have Whataburger taquitos and uh, donut holes and always fresh coffee and so forth. So uh, just encourage you to do that. If you've never been here live, it, it's a great time. And we have we have over 20 men in this room with us right now. So I'm excited about that. Uh, have we scheduled uh, our next Bold Encounter? That's funny you mentioned that. I'm driving in this morning. Um, I was thinking I got to talk to you about scheduling that to see what the calendar looks like, as well as the lodging. <clears throat> okay. What What is our uh, email for the men's ministry, Kevin? Men at opendoorexperience.com. Men at opendoorexperience.com. We're going to be scheduling three to four men's bold encounters next year. We haven't got the date yet. The first one will be in the first quarter, probably uh, end of January, 1st of February. Uh, and if you're interested in that, please email us. And let us know. And, and ladies, we love you. We call you blessed and highly favored. But the key on this one was men's bold encounter. Uh, they do have a ladies' bold encounter, and they're actually doing one. Uh, they did one last weekend. Uh, 
And so if you're interested in that, reach out to the ladies ministry. But uh, we'll take 10 guys. Uh, it starts on a Friday afternoon and ends on a Saturday around one or two. Uh, and we will feed you heartily, incredibly. But the biggest thing about it is we bring in a gentleman from uh, the Quest or Fellowship of the Sword, uh, Michael Cheney, and uh, he facilitates the 22-hour uh, uh, journey. And I'm telling you what, it's 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 powerful. It's mind mind blowing, and I guarantee you, you do not leave the way you came. I, I guarantee that. So if you're interested in that, do that. This year, instead of doing the Alamo trip, we are actually going to be doing a really really awesome awesome. Uh, men's trip we're going to start off leaving on a sunday afternoon and we're going to go straight to redemption ranch and we're going to spend uh, sunday evening all day monday and monday evening at redemption ranch uh, we'll get up tuesday morning and we'll drive to fort davis the davis mountains or that evening we'll actually do a star party out there by the uh, observatory way high up one of the most clearest places in the nation and Pastor Troy will do a star party, and then we'll move from there and go to uh, Big Bend National Park and uh, just just have an incredible week seeking the Lord, uh, enjoying the fellowship of the men. Of uh, those of you that are adventurous, we'll take uh, adventuresome, we'll take some long hikes uh, up in the mountains and stuff like that. It'll be a great time. It'll be a Sunday through Friday trip. That will be in March. We have not set the date and we have not set the price, but I do encourage you. Uh, We'll probably take 20 or 30 guys. Uh, we're going to make Barry G go, the old goat. And uh, he's actually going to pull the cook trailer, and Barry G will be cooking for us. So you know you will not come back thinner than when you left. Even with all the exercise, it will be a great time. So I encourage you to do that. We're also talking about doing some really cool uh, outings at Redemption Ranch throughout the year besides the bold encounters. Uh, we also, you know, we'll be – we do uh, hunting. Uh, the deer hunting is just about done. Uh, starting in the end of January, we'll actually be doing hog hunts with thermals, where uh, we'll go out in the middle of the night, see hog 300 yards out, never turn on a flashlight, never nothing, and pop them and pop them and drop them is what we call it. So if you're interested in that, here's where you need to find all that information. On Facebook, go to Redemption Ranch. I will be putting all that information up of what we'll be doing on the hunting side uh, here in the next week or two. Uh, so I encourage you to do that, but we're also looking at and flirting with, uh, doing a cowboy weekend, a full blown cowboy weekend, working cattle, bringing out a chuck wagon, sleeping in tents. Uh, pastor Troy and I will be out there for that. It'll be, it'll be a man's time, but we're also encouraging it not just be a cowboy weekend, but if you have a son or a nephew or a young man that you're mentoring, mentoring, it will be a conjunction father, son slash father, uh, or uh, uncle, nephew, or or gentleman mentor. So there's some things that we're looking at doing far just on the men's side. So I encourage you, uh, just keep abreast. Uh, check out our Open Door Men's Facebook page. Uh, we'll be doing updating through there, and plus we'll always be sharing it on Tuesday mornings. Now you can talk. You forgot what I was going to say. No, I didn't, but the moment passed. Good. You were talking about sharing your stuff on social media. And I said, I put on mine, the BS has already begun. So you can write your post and you can share it out there and, uh, you can be truthful and, uh, and encourage other men to be a part of this because the BS has already begun. Now, if you don't think that means Bible study, that's your problem. <laughs> If you are watching live, we've, we've actually had, we have a, a, a lady in the Philippines that normally watches us every week. If you are watching live, go ahead and comment on there and uh, tell us where you're at. We call you blessed and highly favored. Uh, how you doing this morning, Bill? Did you survive the weekend? Bill married his daughter off this weekend. That's always a big deal for a daddy. Yeah, we'll call you blessed, my friend. Well, Doug? Do we need to take up a collection for you today, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard i heard i heard the uh uh how do i put this i am i am i am i heard the gamut that's one way of saying it the gamut the gauntlet also just the uh the the extraordinary uh event how it was i've never heard this before they had literally uh, in part of the ceremony in the evening, ballerina dancers. I thought that was pretty cool. 
<laughs> Bill's just grinning and saying, hallelujah. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> if they had ballerina dancers, he definitely needs an offering. <laughs> how, many, how many of you have married off daughters? Okay, we all know what we're talking about here. <laughs> right on. Well, I call you blessed and highly favored, man. I call you guys and all of those of you that are watching blessed and highly favored. It's an incredible time to be alive. Doug, open a sword of prayer, please, sir. I will. Father, what a great day to be alive and just come to you with other men and just sit around the table here and, and have fellowship. Father, we invite your presence in. Uh, we need you, Lord. We need you to fill us up so that we can be your men today wherever you take us. Uh, right now, we're an army gathered, but later we're going to be an army scattered. So prepare us. I pray that you'll be with Pastor uh, Jerry today as he uh, brings the word. Father, anoint him and uh, just help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's posture ourselves this morning for a second. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions, and I'm going to give you a little bit of intro, then we'll get into teaching. I don't want to waste your time, but I think sometimes... We get so functional in our Bible studies, we forget to be relational. That's one of our core values here. So uh, I, uh, over the uh, Thanksgiving holidays, actually flew out before Thanksgiving, uh, took my wife to Cabo, Mexico for six days. And uh, uh, long ago, and, I, and Kevin has joked about this, uh, uh, 11 years ago, Terry and I got married and... Uh, I picked the date. She asked me what I thought, and I picked the date, and and I did it as a a statement of commitment. I hear you moaning over there. I got married on opening day of deer season, so I did it to kind of show you. Yeah, you know, I'm putting you before my greatest passion, which is the outdoors outside the Lord, and uh, and so forth. And so, after about two or three years of celebrating that weekend, we've moved we moved the celebration to Thanksgiving so I can hunt. <laughs> I had an evil plan and it worked. <laughs> so Terry and I were out there and, uh, and it was really, it was amazing. We had a great time. Uh, the Lord really spoke to me in some areas as far as customer service. And I've shared some of that with the staff, uh, uh, but just a whole different perspective, but just being still, man, just being still and doing nothing. Uh, we did, we did one excursion and we went in town a couple of times, but really just didn't do a whole lot. And uh, I have a daily regimen of, of, of what I do and what I read and stuff. And, and one day, uh, while we were out there, I read the scripture we're going to talk about today uh, out of Colossians chapter 1. So you can kind of prepare yourself, and we'll get there in a second. Uh, I'm going to talk about today, and I, I labeled it this, the great transfer. The great transfer. And even just a few seconds ago, I was just kind of thinking how I was going to set this up. I listened to a message, oh, three or four weeks ago, uh, someone sent it to me of Kent Christmas. He pastors, I believe, in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, and I don't remember exactly what the message was. It, it actually was labeled a prophetic uh, a prophetic word about Trump coming back into president. I think they just put that on there to get you to watch it, honestly, because it had nothing to do with Trump. But, but, but it was sent to me, and I said, mm, interesting. And I respect Kent. I, I believe he's a prophet. I believe he's a prophet of value. But in the midst of his message, he said something I hadn't forgot. There's a scripture that says, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. Right? And he said in these last days that we're in, and we are in the last days, I believe the, the coming of, of the Lord Jesus Christ in the form of the rapture is very, very, very close. Um Pastor Troy, a few years ago, uh, told me that, Jerry, we need to get things in order. We need to get things ordered quickly. We have seven years of plenty, and then we're going into seven years of famine. We're about three and a half years into that since he told me that. And I, I really believe. I've heard other prophets say that we're living in the last days of Joseph, which means seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Not trying here to get, I'm not trying to set a timeline and all that. But Kent said this, he said, and he, he really got my attention. He started talking about this last great awakening, this last great move of God, this revival that we've been talking about for uh, decades, literally. And uh, I believe we are walking in the very beginning of the opening of that. He said, if there's going to be a monster awakening, they're talking about a billion soul harvest. 
So I want you to let that sink in. I mean, all of them are agreement. This is going to be a billion soul harvest. This is a monster move of God. It's not going to look like anything we've ever seen. Uh, it's not going to be a traditional move of God that we normally would call, man, that was an awesome revival. It's not going to be anything like that. It's going to be it's going to be so foreign to what we think of. It's going to be so out of the box because we're dealing with millennials who have no ability to comprehend what we've gone through. And we have no ability, honestly, to comprehend how they are. Millennials just make me scratch my head. I just look at them and say, what? But that is going to be part of the great awakening, them coming to Christ, and God is going to use them. We're get, we get to be a part of it, but God is one of the, the, the major forcing uh, or the major gathering of the army of Christ in this last day is going to be these millennials. So we, we need to really focus on how to learn to communicate and get along with them, right? And some of those are my kids. <laughs> I just shake my head. It makes no sense to me. But anyway, he said this, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. He said, you're going to see money transferred into the kingdom like you've never seen before. And so that has nothing to do with my message, but I just thought about that a few minutes ago, the great transfer. And I know some of us, man, we're, uh, when it comes to finances or what we're walking through in, in all this, it's been a challenge the last couple of years. I want to give you hope. I believe there's a great transfer coming. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how God's going to funnel it. I don't know. I don't know the scheme and the plan and the architecture and the blueprints of what God's going to do, but I believe God's going to do it. You can't have a kingdom move without it being finances. Kingdoms cannot progress without resources. It's impossible. Now, it may look different than we've ever seen it before, but if this kingdom move of God is going to happen, it's going to have to be finance. People getting saved costs money. Just does. Building buildings costs money. If we're going to see a mighty move of God, we've got to have a place to house them. It's going to cost billions, and I believe it's coming. Now, it has nothing to do with my message. It just has everything to do with my title. Go with me to Colossians chapter 1. Honestly, what I'm trying to do is make this into a two-part series, actually. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 11. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. That's when I do my just my daily reading. I usually I actually read out of two or three I'll read the Passions, and I'll jump back to the New King James to see the difference, because the Passion's more of a, a poetic, more of a kind of artsy flavor to the Word of God. Colossians chapter 1, understand it's the Apostle Paul that's writing this letter. He's writing it to the church at Colossae, okay? And he says this, and we pray that you would be energized so when I began to read this, this was this is my daily portion of reading. I actually wasn't reading the whole chapter, but I usually go back and read the whole chapter. When I saw that word energized, it was early in the morning. I hadn't had enough coffee, and I said, boy, I need that. Immediately when I think of energized as someone that wakes up in the morning, and back in the day, I would drink a Monster or, or a Red Bull because my, my functionality wasn't 100% engaged, so I needed something. The Energizer Bunny wasn't around, so I couldn't plug into his energy. But when I saw the word energize that morning, sitting on the beach, I said, interesting. I've never seen that in context of Scripture, energize. And it's just the way the, passion, uh, the writer of the Passion Translation shows. And he said, we pray that you would be energized with all his explosive power. Then when I heard that, I said, whoa. It caught my eye. Not only would I have the full energy, but the outcome of the energy would be explosiveness. It's like a fullback running through a block line of, of four defensive linemen, and he explodes through them, and they fall down, and he continues on. And so as I'm reading that, Paul's speaking this over the church. He's saying, I'm praying that you'll step into this new anointing. There's, there's something out there you're not walking in, and I pray that you engage in what's available for you. I want you to be energized with all his explosive power, not your power, not your might, not your strength, not your wisdom, not what you know, but I want you to tap into the place that you become energized with something that's outside of you, his power. Then he says this, 
from the realm of his magnificent glory. The realm. So I normally don't do this, but I'm going I'm to do a little bit of uh, bantering back and forth. I want you to help me out. When you hear the word realm, you say it, then I'm going to repeat it for those that are watching live. When you hear the word realm, what do you think of? Area, atmosphere? Kingdom? Dynamic? Huh? Theater of operations. Okay, theater of operations. So think about this. Paul is saying, hey, I see something. And could him could he be speaking when he says, we pray that you'll be energized? When you speak prophetically, you're speaking something into someone's life they don't have, but it could be their potential, and their potential is a part of the dynamics or the part of the resources that needs to be downloaded to them for them to continue on their journey as they're discovering their identity to begin to walk in their purpose so they can fulfill their destiny, right? So could what he's speaking now actually be prophetic? I pray I see an opportunity for you. You're not there yet, but I pray that you get into the place that you are now energized, charged up with explosive power, and that power comes from the realm. Where does it come from? His magnificent glory. And now he talks about what's the byproduct going to be. If all this comes into place, it fills you. It fills you. Now, I worked on this a little bit two weeks ago. I worked on this all afternoon, then I got back up this morning super early and went over it again. And as I went over again, uh, I got more download. Look at that word filling, just filling. All right, I'm not even to the verse I want to get to. This is just the, the preliminary, the, pre, uh, the prequel. Filling you. As soon as I word that, read that word this morning, filling, I didn't catch it last night, I caught this morning, immediately Luke 6.38. Press down, shaking together, running over, right? Now, when we fill something, like when I drink coffee, I just do a kind of a half cup, I'm a kind of a half cup guy because I can't drink a whole lot, all right? Uh, or, if I, or if I drink water, it's, it's, I'll get a 60-ounce bottle of water and drink on it for four hours because I can't do a lot. So when I fill, I don't go all the way, right? But when Jesus feels, he says, I'm going to press it down. I'm going to shake it because if there's any area that's not filled, I want to make sure it's filled. And I'm going to continue to do it because I just don't fill it partially or halfway or three-fourths. I just don't even fill it to the brim. My, my relationship with you is, is when I fill you with something, it's overflowing because I don't want you just to have it. I want it to fall into your lap. I want those around you to experience it, right? He said, he gave a statement in John. This is my life verse. I love this verse. He said, there's an enemy out there, and he's coming to take away. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He's got a threefold objective. He wants to come at you from the front, and he wants to flank you on both sides. He wants to steal, he wants to kill, and he wants to destroy. The enemies, that's the enemy's target over your life, and you need to understand that. It would be good for you to actually spend some time asking Holy Spirit this week, Holy Spirit, where is the enemy stolen from me? What is he killed and what is destroyed my life? And then go back to Holy Spirit and says, what the enemy has taken, I want it brought back sevenfold. Right? I condemn the mouth of the wicked. And, and when the enemy, Satan, has spoken death and sp spoken spoken over my life, things need to be stolen and that things need to be destroyed. I want, I, I want you, Holy Spirit, condemn his language. Even in the past, I want you to redeem my time. I want you to go back when the enemy spoke that in my life and it came to fruition. And I want you to redeem it because it's been stolen from me, so I want it restored sevenfold. You had that responsibility of stewarding your timeline and even stewarding when the devil won. Because Jesus said, we have victory. Even over our past defeats, we have victory. All right, you, you, you guys that, that, that are in the business world and you steward businesses, how many times have you been stolen from in your business? Take Jesus back in that time I'm going to redeem it and see if he'll give it back to you sevenfold. Right? Now, I'm still not where I want to get, 
but there's so much treasure in the scripture. Jesus said, I've come to give you abundant life. Another tra translation says, I've come to give you life to the fullest. So if Paul's praying prophetically, and if he prayed for the church at Colossae, why can't his prayer be tapped into our place today at Open Door Church, and even in your life, your family, your business, your ministry? Could we say, could we say, and I'm praying that you would be energized with all his explosive power, the things that are roadblocking your advancement, the things that you're trying to move forward on and you believe that you're supposed to go to and you can't get there and there's a roadblock and you don't know how to get through it. He wants you to be energized so you blow through that, right? And that power is downloaded you from his magnificent glory. And what does it do? It fills you with great hope, overflowing hope. No matter the circumstances, no matter the situation, no matter the place that you're in right now, okay? Verse 12. I think I've succeeded to make this a two-part series. At least, at least. <laughs> Verse 12. Filling you with great heart, hope, your hearts can soar. How many this morning need a little uh, upgrade in where your heart's at? So that you're filled with joy so that your hearts can soar. When I read this this morning, like I said, this, all this stuff just came at me this morning. I went to, I think it's Isaiah 40, 31. The verse just left me. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Eagles are always above. Eagles are gifted to soar, right? What is America's symbol? An eagle. Time to America soar again. And you know why America should soar? Because the church lifts her up. Right? Your hearts can soar. What are you soaring with? Joyful gratitude when you think of how God made you. Now catch this next word. Worthy. Worthy. Do you realize when Paul's writing this how much persecution was coming against the church? How many Christians were losing their lives, losing their homes, losing their livelihood? Rome was on the rampage and the gospel was thriving, and Paul gives us this language. You're under persecution. You may have lost loved ones, da 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 I'm going to tell you something. Your hearts can soar with gratitude. It gives a whole different context to the context. Now, the Bible says this is wrong, that you're not to compare yourselves to another Christian. But what if just for a second you put a pause and actually begin to compare yourself to what the Christians were walking through at this time? And Paul gives them this message. Now you pull that out and put it in your circumstance now. You could be filled with joy. You could be filled with hope. Your hearts can soar, soar with joyful gratitude when you think that how God made you worthy. When I read that this morning, just going over this again, I said, ooh, Worthy. When's the last time you looked in the mirror and said, I'm worthy? I'm worthy. When, when, when Paul wrote this and said that God made you worthy, that incorporated all the wickedness you've been involved in. You're still worthy. Those men, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very, very straightforward. Those men who have had affairs, you've stubbed your toe a little bit in the sexual world. Those of you that have struggled with pornography, actually those of us, because I'm sure all of us have at one time in our life, whether it's been on a screen or in your head, still porn, right? Lust, 
addiction, anger, selfish, all the things that, that the world defines you and that your mind reminds you constantly. Paul said, that's not coming from your father because he made you worthy. How could he make you worthy if you're an adulterer? Some of you are a murderer, maybe not physically, but you wanted to kill somebody, right? The world will call you a murderer. The law calls you a murderer. Jesus said, if you have hate in your heart, you're the same as a murderer. But Paul says, he made you worthy. Worthy. Worthy of what? To receive the glorious inheritance. Ah, the great transfer. <clears throat> Freely given to us. Not only are you worthy, even your worth doesn't get you to the place of earning it because it's given to you freely. Now, going through this is one thing. Most of you have probably read the Bible through a few times. And, and I challenge you, I challenge you, because I mean, I've read this probably seven or eight times since I've read it back in Cabo. But this morning, these first two verses all hit me this morning. How many times do we just read God's word and we miss the message? You know, I, I, it was supposed to be in a two-week series and ended up being nine weeks, I think, on Mirror Mirror. And I'm actually going to I'm actually going to re regurgitate it tomorrow night. I'm speaking tomorrow night uh, at church, and I'm going to I'm going to I'm not going to do nine weeks worth tomorrow. By the way, <laughs> yes, I won't take the highlights of it. <laughs> oh, we're, I forgot where I was going. But in the part of that, in the part of that teaching on mirror, mirror, I uh, talked about the word meditation out of Joshua chapter one, verse eight. Uh, in a lot of in a lot of teachings, meditations uh, means regurgitate to, to simmer. Uh, actually, part of the meditation, uh, it it's uh, yeah, ruminate like a cow does. Uh, but if you look. If you look in the eastern part of the world and you look in the eastern religions, a lot of those that meditate, you see this. You know what? Jews do this at the Wailing Wall when they're praying. It's, it's a prophetic movement in the midst and positioning of meditation. But meditation don't only mean that. We went back into Isaiah 34 where it talks about as a lion growls over its prey. Meditation is uh, fierceful. And it, we went into talking about how, how you're to go after thoughts and all that. But many times when we go through the Word of God, we read to accomplish a task. We don't read from the standpoint of meditating on what it says. Right? All right? Men are goal task-driven, right? We read so we can check it off our box, so we can be good little... Christians that we read God's word today, right? But reading God's word is not always what we need to do. We actually need to sit at the table and eat. You got to chew on the bread of life, right? It's not shove it down your throat, swallow it, so you can get on with the day. So, your hearts can soar with gr joyful gratitude when you think about how God think. Ooh, 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 ooh! Think that word comes out of uh, uh, Romans twelve two that we would not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Thinking, meditating on how God made you worthy. I guarantee, if you spent most of your day just when you're still and quiet, thinking about how worthy you are, because God made you that way. <laughs> That way you can get away from all the crap you've done that you think's wrong. You can spell that to the side because it doesn't matter what you've done. God trumps what you do. He made you worthy. What would your day be like if you just thought about how worthy you are? You said, well, Jerry, that's kind of selfish, isn't it? Well, no. 
If God thinks that about you, why shouldn't you? Right? If Jesus is in you, if you really believe that Jesus is in you, don't you think you're worthy? <clears throat> you know, it's actually, for those of you who feel uncomfortable with that, it's actually a way of giving praise to God. Mm -hmm. It's actually a way of worshiping Him because He thinks that highly of you. And, That's why you have joyful gratitude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was just hoping that you would get to the next word. <laughs> Your hearts can soar, uh, soar. I'm worthy even though I can't speak. <laughs> I'm worthy because I make up all kinds of words. It's, an, it's called Jerry's Dictionary of Jerry Abonics. Jerryism. Your hearts can soar with joyful gratitude. By the way, Troy makes fun of me all the time because of this. It is what it is. When you think about how God made you worthy, to receive the glorious inheritance. I love it. I got something coming. I've already, I'm already starting to get, I've already been able to go and start uh, withdrawing some of that inheritance. A heritage that's just is not uh, for eternity, it's for now. Maybe, maybe if things are a challenge for you right now, maybe you need to start asking God, I need to make a withdrawal out of my inheritance. Why would not he give it to you? He's a good, good father, right? Now, he's only going to give you really what you need, and sometimes he'll give you what you want, but he's not going to give you things that's going to cause you to go a different direction. That's not a good, good father, right? It's just like when I was little, I loved, I loved to escape the house and go, and it's, even when I was barely able to walk, I loved to escape the house and run in the yard. Now, I, I had the choice to do that, and my mom and dad had the choice to let me, but my street was a bad street. And so they choose not to let me go very far and reroute me. Thank God I wouldn't be here today. Your hearts can soar with joyful gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy to receive the glorious inheritance that was freely given to us by living in the light. Now here's where I want to get, verse 13. I want you to listen to this verbiage. He has rescued us completely. He has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness. Okay? So let me, let me give you some. I did a lot of study on these words. So let me give you a little bit of uh, this, and we'll probably finish here because I, I got a lot to go through. He has rescued us completely. You have been rescued, all right? He's rescued you completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness. That word tyrannical means unjustly, cruel, harsh, severe, arbitrary, or oppressive. He's rescued you from being oppressed. He's rescued you from being treated unjustly, cruel, harsh, or severe. Now, I'm going to ask Doug this because Doug does have a PhD. I don't know what it means because he's still... He, he's so smart he didn't know how to, what the proper use of ketchup. That that is a that is that is I just shut up. Jerry asked me to get ketchup today, y'all. Four eggs, <laughs> not to put on a fifty a dollar pound of steak. Anyway, yeah. Or if you buy from Doug now, they're fifty dollars a pound. Price of steaks going up. All right, what does depostic mean? And don't look at my notes. You ever heard that word, depositic? Or is it like a despot? I don't know. Like, I've, I've like a heard, tyrannical ruler? I've never heard that word, depositic, before. Well, like, uh, it would be a dictator. Okay. Now, actually, have you heard that word before? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I translate Jerryisms. There you go. Hey, that is Hick. That's Hick Dictionary. That word means to oppress one under. It means to press one under the influence or under your authority. So God has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness, or God has rescued us completely from one who has been oppressed under someone else's authority. 
or influence. God has rescued us from the unjust cruelty of the demonic rule of darkness. He has rescued us from harshness, from severity, and being oppressed. Do you understand that you've been rescued? You've been rescued. You don't have to bow down to lust no more. You don't have to give in to addiction. You don't have to give in to... Uh, uh, you don't have to give in to the lie that you're not worthy. You don't have to give in to the lie, the abusive lie that you have no value, that you're good for nothing, that you'll never amount to nothing. Some of the things some of your fathers have said to you probably in the past. You're nothing but a screw up. You're stupid. You're not capable. You don't have to bow down to that thought anymore. You don't have to be oppressed by the by the demonic lies that have been spoken over your life all these years because you've been rescued from that. That's still not where I'm trying to get. But once you understand that, you have been rescued. You've been rescued from that and you've been translated into the kingdom realm of his dear son whom he loves. The great transfer. Now, I'm going to go about five more minutes, and then I'm going to pick back up next week with verse 13. Let me read you the NIV. That was the Passion Translated. The NIV says this, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. The New King James says it this way, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son and his love. So in the beginning, you have, you have rescued twice and you have delivered once. Each translation is using a different word and it comes from the same root Greek word, but also uses other Greek words to kind of colorfully define it. Now, I want to pull out three different words out of these three different versions. All right? Translated, brought, and uh, conveyed. There we go. He's rescued or delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness, and he's translated us into the kingdom of the Son. He's brought us into the kingdom of the Son, and he's conveyed us in the kingdom of the Son. This is actually where I want to be, and then I got quite a bit we'll talk about next week. The word translated comes from the word... You want to try to pronounce that, Doug? Uh, Metastasin. Matestesen. I, I don't know which one's right, but mine sounds better. <laughs> go with yours. yours is flavored with ketchup. All right, no. Well, mine has ketchup on. Look, it's red underneath. <laughs> the word M E T E S T E S E N. That's the Greek word. Is often translated delivered in the English translations but can also mean transpose or even translate. This once again highlights God's rescue of the believer from the power of sin and its consequence and the power of darkness. What it's saying is Christian believers are not merely protected from the penalty of sin, they are radically removed from it. That opens a whole new can. See, we read this and we skip over the life-giving truth. That one word, delivered, means we have not been merely protected from sin, the power of sin, the penalty of sin, the product of sin, the purpose of sin. We're not only protected from all that, but we have been removed from it. We live as if we have 80-20, you know, like our, our insurance, it'll pay 80, 80 and we got to pay 20. Then we're somewhat protected from the disease, but not all the way. That's how we live our lives. Paul said, you've been removed from it. Quit putting yourself in a place that you don't belong. 
That's the word translated. The word brought means to transfer, depose, or exchange. It literally means to remove suddenly. When God brought you out of the kingdom of darkness and brought you into the kingdom of his dear son, it means to do it immediately, quickly, suddenly. It's accelerated move. It's not a long pause on the chest whether you're going to move your bishop or not. You do it immediately go for the kill. The word conveyed means to transport or carry to another place. The mission here is this. A fearless demonstration of freedom, redemption, and the goodness of God. That word redemption right there. One reason why we called the ranch what we call it, Redemption Ranch. It's a move. It's moving from one dominion into his dominion. It's Redemption Ranch. Because of redemption, which we call salvation, because there was a cross, because there was a death, and because of there was a resurrection, Jesus literally rescued us. He literally delivered us. He literally translated us. He literally conveyed us. There was a great transfer. Salvation is not just about your sin. Get that. Jesus coming and dying is not just about your sin. It is a portion. It's the very first portion. But it doesn't end there. I've said this before. Most of my ministry has all has been about the destination. It's changed in the last few years. But my major focus in ministry for most of my life, the first 23 years of my ministry, my major focus was getting everybody to heaven. That's a big deal. It is a very big deal. You need to be a soul winner. And God is going to ask you on Judgment Day how many you brought to him. Was you a faithful witness? Did you share what his son did for you? It's your responsibility to influence those that you have influence over, you come in contact with. You're responsible to share the blood of Jesus Christ and what he's done in your life and how they can have eternal life. He told the disciples, go and make disciples. You have a responsibility to share what Jesus did so others can be set free from sin. But that is not the full gamut of the orders that were given. Salvation is not just about a sin payment. Salvation is not just about removing us from eternal judgment. Salvation is about a complete transfer. Which these words in the Greek were used to give definition. The word translate, the word brought, and the word conveyed. Here's what it literally means. When he says that you have been translated out of the king of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, this is what it means. God literally chose to step in and pick you up from one place and put you in another place. To be justified means to be picked up from sin and put into a place of in state of justification, just as if you've never sinned. It is a transfer. It is being removed from one kingdom that has dominion over you, which has been the kingdom of darkness, which when you're under that kingdom, you are oppressed, you're tortured, you're belittled, you're downsized. You're being held captive and you're a slave. And he's literally picked you up out of that kingdom and put you into another kingdom, the kingdom of his dear son, where now you walk in liberty, you've been set free. No longer are you a slave, but now you are a son. He has thoroughly changed our state. He's brought us out of the dark region of vice, and he's placed us in a kingdom under the government of his dear son. It means that we who are Christians have been transferred one, one kingdom to another as if a people has been removed. They become subjects of a new kingdom. They're under different laws, and they belong to a different community. Now, I'm going to give you four conclusions, and I'm going to come back next week and go through this again so we can be refreshed. The transfer awakens us to four conclusions. It means a transference of light, uh, darkness to light. That means you can see now. 
You're not stumbling about in your way. You don't have to walk not knowing where to go. The Bible says, and I'll read this next week, he has given us the spirit of truth and the spirit of, and this spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth that we may know what is to come. We don't have to walk in darkness no more. It's a transference from darkness to light. It's a transference from slavery to freedom. It's a transference from condemnation, guilt, and shame to forgiveness, joy, hope, and peace. If you do not have joy, hope, and peace, you're living as if you've never been transferred. You're living from the wrong position. That's why you need to remove your mind. Even in the midst of all hell breaking loose, even in the midst of lack when you should be living in the midst of plenty. Maybe, just maybe, the lack you're going through is because where your mind's at. I'm not saying that it's the case. I'm just saying that could be a possibility. And the last conclusion is, it means a transference from the power of Satan to the power of God through Jesus Christ. And that's where I want to get next week. The whole thing out of Genesis chapter 1, 28, when God told Adam, I want you to subdue and have dominion. I want you to overcome your enemy so forcibly that he rules underneath you. So if we've been translated into his kingdom, we live under different rules and we live with different resources. And part of that resource goes all the way back to what I read this morning. Energized with his explosive power. And I want to set up a case next week why you should be walking in the power of God and not walking the way you are today. Because you've been translated. This has been burning in my spirit for two or three years, and I don't have it figured out. But I do know that God is expecting me to walk in signs, miracles, and wonders. He's expecting me, like Peter walked through the streets in the book of Acts, that his shadow healed people because he was translated. And he walked in a power that we do not know of. I want to end it with this. God said in the last days he's going to pour out a spirit upon all flesh. The dynamite spirit of God that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. He's expecting you and I to act like different kingdom men. And he's expecting you and I to get to the place where we walk in this energized, explosive power that where we walk, it changes the dynamics. Literally, like they were walking in the promised land, everywhere we put our foot belongs to us. And when we touch our foot to the ground, the power that we walk in ought to change the atmosphere where we walk. I believe this with all my heart. I don't know how to make it happen. But I'm still pursuing it. But I do believe I'm required to speak the truth. You are men of God. You have... You have so much worth. Jesus didn't die for the fallen angels. Jesus died for you. Right? At the judgment seat, there's going to be an extreme evaluation on how we walked in his power. It's not about you. You belong to the King of kings and Lord of lords. You belong to the one who stepped out on nothing and spoke everything into its existence. And he lives in you. What is he using you to create? Because he's not done creating. This, this, is a, this is a weighty word. And here's what this is. This is not a word of shame or condemnation because you're not walking into it. This is a word of invitation to walk up to it. He's calling every one of you men to rise up. Those of you that have gone to quest will know this phrase, play the man. Play the man. And not the man the kingdom of darkness has been trying to tell you all your life who you are not. Play the man to whom God is telling you who you are. So I'll end with this famous slogan that a lot of you at some time in your life have worn on your shoes. Just do it. Just do it.
You guys got anything? That's just three verses. That's just scratching the... That, that, that's just like the woman coming up to Jesus as he's walking through and she touches the hem of his garment and that energized power entered her. Change the game, man. Change the game. Just like the 120 that were in the upper room and, and when the fire of tongues fell upon them, they were all endued with power. God expects us to walk in that same power. He's not a respecter of persons. When he told the disciples, go and make disciples, teaching them all that you observed, he says, I want you to get more people translated. There's a great transfer. You want to pray for us, Kevin? <clears throat> Father, you are so, so good. Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for uh, the direction that you have shared with Pastor Jerry to share with us. So, Father, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of us these next few days on what it looks like for us personally to be transferred and help us to walk through that transformation. Father, my desire for me and, and for everybody else, Lord God, is that uh, we would want to be transformed into your image and how you want it to look, not how we want it to look. Father, help us to step aside and let you take over. Father, I love you. I praise you. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for your faithfulness to chase after us the way that you do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, this will be re-aired Thursday night and uh, next Monday evening, 6.30 p.m. for both of them. Next Tuesday morning, I'm assuming Jerry's going to finish this up at yeah. 6.30 a.m. Uh, we'll have breakfast again, coffee. Gentlemen, thank you. See you soon. All right, guys, what we need to do, I, I know you guys always help us break down. We need to put the tables up.